Well, friends, good morning. Uh, it's good to see everyone this morning. It's great to have people back uh, in the room with us. Thank you for being a part of in-person worship. I want to thank everyone who is uh, tuning in via live stream or later on uh, in the course of the coming days. We're so thankful that we get a chance to be together as one church in person and remote uh, as the body of Christ here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. My name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church. I'd invite you, whether you're in the room or watching uh, online, I'd encourage you to take out your cell phones. a great time to silence them. Uh, and a great time to check in. If you've never used our check-in uh, process before, uh, you're going to simply uh, text the phrase first. That's the number 1ST uh, first to the number 313-131. Uh, the number 313-131, text first to 313-131. If you've used this before, you're going to text the word uh, check-in to that same number. Uh, check-in to 313-131. Again, check into 313-131. Uh, as we continue to press on in this Lenten season, we are preparing for a Holy Week and uh, Easter weekend. We're going to have a lot of offerings, uh, many in-person offerings for the Holy Week and Easter season. So please stay tuned for uh, the release of the dates and times of all the services and gatherings and events that we'll have uh, during that week and that weekend. Um, in preparation for Easter Sunday, we have a practice at First Pres where we uh, purchase flowers uh, for uh, worship spaces uh, on Easter Sunday that memorialize or honor uh, folks that we want to lift up and elevate. Uh, you're able to purchase Easter flowers this year. Uh, we didn't do this last year, but we'll do it this year. Uh, where you can go online to our website and you click on Give. And as you go through that portal, you'll be able to select Easter Memorial Flowers if you want to give flowers in honor, or again, in memory of uh, someone. The deadline is at the end of this month. So if you are thinking about that, I encourage you uh, to do that uh, today. Uh, sad news uh, to report, uh, very sad news in the life of our community uh, one of our current elders, sitting elders, a member of session, Del Reardon, uh, died just two days ago uh, following a very, very brief uh, battle with pancreatic cancer. Uh, Del uh, has served faithfully in the life of this church. She was very active uh, in leadership up until her diagnosis. Uh, it went very quickly. It was a shock to our whole community, a shock to our session. Um, she's been very active in leadership, as I said. Uh, her son Allison and uh, or her daughter Allison, rather, and her son Robert, her seven grandchildren, want to encourage you to keep them in prayer in these coming days. Most likely there will be a service, and most likely it'll be limited, and we'll have it via live stream for those who knew Dell uh, and want to honor her life and be a part of that service. We'll make sure that the congregation uh, is aware of that. But again, please keep Dell family and all our friends and our session in prayer as we grieve her death. Our call to worship uh, this morning is printed in your order for worship. For those who are worshiping remotely, for those in the room, you can access that via our website. If you checked in, we've sent you a link with the liturgy. But these are words written by Anne Siddall, and I think they're appropriate to set the pace and tone of our worship today. Friends of God, believe this. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are the beloved. May the truth of this great love story shine through our worship today and renew our sense of calling. So friends, come with your tiredness, your frustrations and your discouragements. Come with your doubts, your fears, and your longings. Come to discover yet again how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. Come in friendship to God and to each other, and in friendship to the world, to listen for God's word to us, to offer our prayers, and to renew our calling. Beloved, let us worship our God. Please stand. I don't want this 
Before we pray, one quick announcement. Um, after the prayer, during the responsive hymn, children will be invited to go to godly play. Sarah Kate is waiting to receive them during our hymn. But for now, let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, you loved the whole world into being with a love that gives life, nurtures relationships, and builds community. We in our finiteness can hardly fathom a love like that. And yet, it is the essence of our very being that we are God's beloved. May we know that who we are is love. We lift our prayers to you this morning, knowing that the world is not as it should be. There is violence. There's poverty, disease, and despair. We've often failed to understand that eternity begins now, that the life you offer is here, and that it transcends death. We've often failed to understand how, that how we live matters, and that sometimes we participate in the sins of this world without recognizing it. We've often sinned in our purchases, in our desires, in our shrugging shoulders, in our longing to just focus on ourselves. Forgive us and call us back to you, God who loves the world, so that we might remember you came not to condemn, but to save. Help us to turn our hearts and be restored to you. We know that when we remember who you created us to be, we find the true life and treasures of heaven. God, you love the world into being. May we be united with you and all others, earnestly seeking to live lives of love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our first reading this morning is from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the serpents away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second text is uh, from the Gospel of John corresponds with this text from Numbers as Jesus references it in this conversation he has with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. A familiar story, I think, to many of us. John 3, verses 1 through 21. Continue to listen to God's word to you and to me. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, without being born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The the wind blows where it chooses, and, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I I tell you, we, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and yet people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, break open this ancient word afresh to us this day so that we'd be challenged and we'd be changed even to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. 
Henry II, uh, the king of France, came to power on the last day of March, 1547. And, and four years into his tenure, he affirmed an order called the Edict of Chateaubriand. And the main objective of this decree, the main objective of this edict, was to stop the growth of Protestantism in France. Was to stop the Protestant church and Protestant ideas from growing and taking further hold in uh, France. Remember, the Protestant movement in 1547 was about 30 years old, beginning first in Germany and then continued throughout Western Europe. Remember that reformer John Calvin, right, an exiled Frenchman himself, living in Geneva. At this very time, he was writing and preaching and teaching actively against Roman Catholic doctrine and some practices within the Roman Mass. Calvin's work and his theology, of, of course, many of you know this, would become uh, the backbone of the Reformed faith and give birth to our tradition, uh, the Presbyterian Church. Well, even before this, this edict, Henry II was fiercely, fiercely opposed to Protestantism, and he was fiercely loyal to the Roman Church. And in the year he came to power, Henry II created something called the Burning Chambers, which didn't get its name by accident. It was a special court to judge cases of heresy against the Catholic Church. And at the same time, it was a place to carry out summary judgments of those who were deemed to be heretics. And you can assume by the name of this chamber what those punishments and judgments might look like. When the Edict of Chateaubriand passed, it actually gave civil and ecclesiastical power and authority to persecute Protestants. Books were banned. Uh, Protestant property was actually confiscated. Protestant teaching in all the universities in France, uh, th those teachings were outlawed. And correspondence, simple letter writing with Calvin and the French exiles who were living in Geneva who were Protestants, that was against the law too. Historian Bonnie Patterson notes that there were, were real consequences for those in, in France who subscribed to the Protestant faith. It really, for, for that time, for those Protestants, it really was a matter of life and death. It's hard for us to imagine such a scenario, but for them, it was a matter of life and death. Dr. Patterson goes on to explain, she said, out of a fear of persecution, many French Protestants sought to live publicly according to Catholicism while privately holding to Protestant doctrine. So during this time in France, there was this group of secret Protestants who acted like they were Catholic, but actually held to Protestant teaching and Protestant doctrine. And during this time, these particular secret Protestants earned a very particular nickname. It was a name given to them, not by the Catholics, but given to them by other Protestants who were actually open and public and transparent about their convictions. These were Protestants who were unapologetically Protestant and spoke freely against uh, the Catholic Church, the Church of Rome. And that group of Protestants, the open and public group of Protestants, named the secret group of Protestants Nicodemites. Nicodemites. Obviously, that name comes from this character we meet in the third chapter of John. This Pharisee, right, called Nicodemus. You see, biblical interpretation in the 16th century assumed that Nicodemus was a divided man. That he had divided allegiance. He went to Jesus at night. And the assumption around that fact in this story was that he... He didn't want anyone to know that he was actually looking for Jesus, let alone the possibility that he was sympathetic to Jesus' ministry and his movement. And the flattery that Nicodemus offers at the beginning of the story when he declares that Jesus, quote-unquote, comes from God, right? It's a clue, interpreters back in the 16th century assumed. It's a clue that he has this emerging faith, that he has this emerging affinity toward Jesus, toward this rabbi from Nazareth. And yet, right, and yet these same interpreters would also note that Nicodemus kept his alliance and his allegiance with the leaders of, uh, of the Pharisees of the day, the leaders of the time. 
And so for 16th century interpreters, Nicodemus, for them, was just like the Protestants in France, right? Who not only kept their beliefs private and secret, but also participated in the religious life of the Catholic Church so they could avoid persecution and so they could avoid consequences. Now, John Calvin had a particular disdain for Nicodemites, right? He actually wrote a lot about them during his life. He once wrote this, such people are only half committed to the gospel. When it no longer panders to their needs, they are more or less ready to give up. Now, just as an aside, this was easy. This is easy for Calvin to write uh, because he was living in the safety and security of Geneva at the time, away from France, and it was easy for him to criticize uh, these Protestants who kept their faith secret. That's a whole other sermon. But Calvin, Calvin was convinced that the true believer ought to live with integrity. In his judgment, Christian belief, what you believe and what you do, should have integrity. They, they, should, they should match up. They shouldn't be divided. They shouldn't be at odds with one another. And no matter the cost, he said, no matter the cost, even if it meant martyrdom, the true Protestant needed to profess their faith and denounce the idolatry in the Roman church. So you might be wondering, why does all of this matter for today? It matters because whether you're aware of it or not, there is a strong likelihood that your understanding or your impression of this character named Nicodemus, the understanding that many of us have been taught over the years, it's been profoundly shaped by Calvin and profoundly shaped by this Nicodemite controversy that's almost 500 years old. People have thought very similar thoughts since this time about this character named Nicodemus, right? Many sermons, many Bible studies over the years have presented Nicodemus as this ambiguous and ambivalent character. He's often portrayed as one who is divided in his belief, divided in his allegiance. He's been presented as one who's a genuine seeker. He's actually seeking after Christ, someone who perhaps even sympathized with his movement. And yet at the same time, it was believed that he remained committed to the Pharisees, that he remained committed to their rules and their way of understanding God and their way of understanding the world. And, and chances are, if you've been around the church for any length of time and you've heard a sermon on John 3, you've heard a sermon about Nicodemus, you've been invited, right, to see yourself in him as one who sometimes keeps our faith secret. Many of us know what that's like as one who keeps our faith secret or keeps it sort of in the dark, or as ones who can't always fully commit, who have our allegiance pulled in two different directions, or as ones who can't always make up our minds. We want to follow Jesus, right? But we also want to follow other passions. We want to follow other powers. If that was Nicodemus, if that was the authentic Nicodemus in John 3, we totally get that, right? We understand that character. We understand what it's like to be divided. We understand what it means to have a, a compartmentalized faith. If that, if that was the true Nicodemus, if that was John 3 Nicodemus, then, then we understand him. This morning, however, and I know I'm like 10 minutes in, but that's not the sermon I'm preaching. That's not the Nicodemus I want to introduce to you this morning. This morning, I want you to look at Nicodemus in a different way. I want you to look at him in a slightly different light. And in order to do that, I want to begin by leaning into some insights made by a contemporary scholar who dabbles in the discipline of ancient rhetoric. His name is Ben Whittington, and he teaches at Baylor University. And he suggests that if we're really going to understand the Nicodemus, the authentic Nicodemus of John chapter 3, that we have to know something about ancient rhetoric, right? That we have to know something about ancient rhetoric, how it functioned in texts like these. And we have to know something about character types. We have to know something about character types from the ancient world. And so to that end, he actually turns to Aristotle. Actually turns to Aristotle's most famous pupil and who would eventually become his successor, a man by the name of Teratimus. 
And Teratomus lived in the 4th and 3rd century B.C. So among many of his philosophical and scientific and academic accomplishments, Teratomus produced a book that was simply called Characters. Characters. And in this short volume, he lays out 30 character types that depict different ways he observed Athenian men behaving badly. Okay? Now, if Jamie Butcher, one of our pastors, was here, I'd say it's sort of a precursor to the Enneagram. Many of you have done Enneagram work with, with, with Pastor Jamie. Um, this, though, doesn't have any positives to it, right? Teratomus was only thinking about the 30 characters that show up in immoral ways. 30 different snapshots of immoral behavior and how to recognize them. And each type, each type had a name. And under each type, there was a simple paragraph that described their immorality, right? There were names like the flatterer, the gossip, the social climber, the oligarch, the shameless man, the talker, right? The busybody, it sounds like a Seinfeld episode, the complainer, right? What's so amazing about this particular work is while those uh, character types are about 2,400 years old, they still play in our time, right? You can access this online. You can Google this, Teratomus' characters, and you can see that there are folks you know in modern Atlanta that display the same characteristics that, as those uh, were displayed in ancient Athens, right? So one of the 30 characters goes by this name, the ironical man, or the ironical person. And this is how Dr. Whittington describes this character. He says, the ironical person conceals their true feelings as they come to their enemies and willingly converse with them. They are evasive. They are noncommittal. They invent excuses. They are capriciously misleading and offer up professions of disbelief such as, I don't believe it, or I can't imagine it. I'm amazed when they actually do believe it, when they can actually imagine it, and when they're not all that amazed. And I wonder if you're starting to see how the dots are being connected. I'm wondering if this rhetorical characterization describes this one known as Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus, right? Walk with me through this text again. He comes to Jesus, heaping praises upon him. He says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. But Jesus is his enemy. The Pharisees and the religious leaders play the antagonistic, the antagonist role, rather, in John's gospel. Why is Nicodemus any different this early on in the story? As part of the leadership of the Pharisees, Jesus would be persona non grata for Nicodemus. Perhaps, perhaps, in this encounter, Nicodemus engages Jesus concealing his true feelings. Perhaps Nicodemus hides his anger or his animosity toward Jesus as he shows up with flattery and platitudes. Perhaps, perhaps we've gotten it wrong about Nicodemus. Perhaps he's not a believer. Perhaps he's not actually even a seeker, right? You turn back to John 3. Jesus delivers that famous line. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again or born from above. This phrase can literally mean to be born a second time. It also, as we understand, Jesus keeps teaching that he's thinking of it in a spiritual sense, not a literal sense, that we're born of the Spirit, right? But Nicodemus feigns misunderstanding, right? He, he pretends to be ignorant, right? He comes off as, as confused and puzzled. But what if, what if this is all part of his game? What if that confusion is actually intentional? What if he really does understand what Jesus is actually saying? Like uh, Teratomus' ironical person who's prone to say, I don't believe it, I can't imagine it, or I'm amazed. Nicodemus says, how can anyone be born after growing old? What if he's pretending to miss the point? What if he's... What if he's faking ignorance and misunderstanding? And what if Jesus, in this encounter, is actually calling him out on it? In verse 7, right, what does he say? He says, don't be amazed. Don't be astonished. In other words, don't act like you're amazed or dumbfounded or that you lack understanding regarding what I'm talking about. This is like a parent with younger children. When you ask them to do something, and they say, I didn't hear you, right? 
We know what that's like. And Jesus is like, you heard me. You get it. You know what I'm talking about. You should, you uh, among all these people should understand it. It's fundamental. If you're going to see the kingdom of God, you got to be born of the spirit. But Nicodemus, he actually, as the story goes on, he keeps playing the fool. How can these things be? And Jesus actually calls him out again. Calls him out a second time. Aren't you a teacher of the law? Aren't, aren't you a religious leader? How come you're acting like you don't understand this? And if this is the authentic Nicodemus, we have to ask the question, why? Why would he pretend to be ignorant? Why would he fake misunderstanding? What was his motive? Perhaps a simple illustration from my own life that I'm willing to share uh, may help in considering this, this question. When I was a boy and we moved out of urban Philadelphia and into the suburbs, my chore list expanded to include yard work. It was something very new for us. I was 11 years old, uh, and now that we moved to the suburbs, we actually had a yard, a front yard and a backyard, and it needed tending to. One day, my father brought me outside to teach me how to use the lawnmower. It was really the first time I'd ever touched a lawnmower, right? Because we didn't have a lawnmower in our other house, because obviously you can't cut sidewalk or alleyway blacktop, right? You don't need a lawnmower in urban Philadelphia. Anyway, he gave me some simple instructions. He taught me how to, you know, pull the handle, get the engine going, and he taught me how to cut the lawn. He turned me loose, and he went inside. And even though I completely and totally understood his instructions, and even though I completely and totally understood how to work the lawnmower, I purposefully left patches. I purposefully zigzagged in the front lawn, didn't do the back lawn, but did the front lawn zigzagging, leaving spots and tracks. When my father came outside, he was absolutely livid. I told you what to do, he said. What happened? To which, in my own 11-year-old way, I said, I guess I didn't understand your instructions. He then stepped in front of me, grabbed the lawnmower, told me to go inside the house, which I did, and truth be told, that's where I wanted to be in the first place. And he finished, he finished cutting the lawn. I faked ignorance. I faked incompetence precisely because I did not want the responsibility of cutting the grass. And I wonder, friends, it, what if that's what's going on with Nicodemus? Have you ever thought about it from that perspective? What if he's faking ignorance or misunderstanding or astonishment when he really does understand what Jesus is saying? What if he understands it perfectly? What if he understands the gospel? What if he understands the cost of discipleship? What if he understands that he'll have to follow Jesus to the cross what if he understands that he must live differently and lead differently and, and believe differently? What if he really understands what it meant to be born again, to be born of the Spirit? And what if he's using his ignorance as a way to not follow through on the thing he knows Jesus is asking him to do, to be born again, to really be born of the Spirit? And I wonder, friends, what if that's going on in some way with us? What, what if that's going on in our own faith journey, right? Because just as I can understand a divided allegiance and a compartmentalized faith, I can understand that. I also can understand Nicodemus' motives as the ironical person. He pretends to not understand the call that Jesus extends to him because he doesn't want the responsibility. And how many times have have we consciously or subconsciously said, you know what, I really don't understand what it means to love my neighbor. Or I really don't understand what it means to love my enemy. Or I really don't understand what it means to be generous. Or I really don't understand what it means to bless those who curse me. I really don't understand what it means to worship the Lord your God only. I really don't understand what it means to be born from above, to be born from the Spirit. I really don't understand this whole gospel thing when in actuality we know exactly what it means. But we feign ignorance and we feign misunderstanding because of what the Christian life actually requires of us. 
the responsibility of what it means to follow Christ in every way. This is a hard question. I'm asking it to myself, and I'm asking it of each and every one of you. Where am I or where are you feigning ignorance in your life to avoid the responsibility of living as an authentic Christian? Where are you feigning misunderstanding or faking ignorance to avoid the very thing you know God is calling you to do? I'll close with this. Nicodemus, right, he seems to just evaporate from this story in John 3. He just sort of exits the stage. Interestingly, he actually shows up two more times in the Gospel of John. And most importantly for our part together today, he shows up at his crucifixion. And I actually forgot this until I was preparing for the sermon. I forgot that in John's Gospel, Nicodemus actually is at the crucifixion. And the way we know that is because the Gospel writer John says that Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, actually take the body of Jesus off the cross. He takes the body of Jesus off the cross. You can't get closer than that to touch his broken and dead body, to prepare it for for burial. And I think what this is telling us is that Nicodemus actually does come around. I think Nicodemus does actually take responsibility. He sees Jesus lifted up on the cross. He doesn't turn his eyes away. He understands what has taken place. He understands the cost of discipleship. He's holding it in his hands. Nicodemus no longer fakes ignorance. He knows precisely what Jesus was up to and what Jesus was asking him to do. And the image of Nicodemus preparing Jesus' body for burial means that he was willing to go all the way, even to the tomb. And so I ask, what about you? What about me? Will we feign ignorance of the gospel of Jesus Christ any longer? Will we keep telling ourselves, or even telling God, that we don't understand, that we don't know how to do it, that, that we're incompetent, just to avoid the hard work of the Christian life? Or will we take on that responsibility in a new and fresh way in this season? Will we take up our cross and follow Jesus all the way to the tomb? Will we take up the responsibility of discipleship and stop pretending like we don't know what it actually means to follow him, to be born of the Spirit, or to enter and receive the goodness of his kingdom. What about you? What about you? Let us pray. Lord, we are very familiar with what it means to have a divided faith and divided allegiance. There's so much pulling us in different directions in this life and in this world. We're also getting a little bit of a glimpse and some sense about the ways in which we show up as the ironical person. We, we hear the gospel week in and week out. We, we hear the stories of Jesus week in and week out. And, we, and sometimes we show up like we don't understand. And we know, Lord, the curiosity uh, is something that you want us to bring and an inquiry is something that you want us to bring. But there does come a point, we know, God, that, that where we have to make a choice and stop faking like we don't understand what your call looks like on our lives and actually follow you, even if it means going to death's doorstep, even to the tomb. So give us the courage, give us the fortitude to step out of the darkness and step into the light, to continue to follow you in deeper and more meaningful ways, to be that much more of an authentic Christian who lives into the call that you've placed upon us to follow your Son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Friends, if you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song. Breathe on me, breath of God.
Perhaps it's uh, time to stop faking like we don't understand. Maybe there's parts within your Christian life that, that that's where you've been. That you know that you've heard this gospel, you've heard this word from God, and you know that's the way you need to go, but you're zigzagging across the front lawn of your faith. Uh, perhaps it's time to say, yes, I understand, and yes, I'm going to receive this responsibility. This next chapter, this next level of depth in my faith and in my life. Maybe now's the time to say yes, to step out of that darkness and step into the light. And for that journey, may, may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May his peace live inside of you this day and every day ahead. Amen and be at peace.